Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this panel uh, uh, based around Anam Zakria's uh, groundbreaking uh, book, 1971, A People's History from Bangladesh, uh, uh, Pakistan, and India. Uh, Anam, uh, I know Anam personally, and I'm also a loyal reader of her, so it's a real uh, matter of pleasure and honor uh, to be moderating this panel, uh, but more so because we are joined by really uh, yeah, great uh, uh, speakers and writers uh, with us. Uh, Ali Usman Kasmi joins us from Lahore. He is a professor of history at LAMS. He's also a historian himself. Urvashi Batalia needs no introduction. Uh, one of uh, She's a publisher as well as a foremost uh, uh, historian, people's historian and an oral history specialist on uh, India and Pakistan, and particularly her work on partition uh, is uh, widely known and engaged with everywhere in the world, wherever people want to know more about 1947. And Nad Nad Nadim Zaman is a writer from Bangladesh. He's a published author. And it is a pleasure to have them all and speak about the book. So before I uh, go on to our panelists, I would like to just to make a few points. Uh, this is such an important uh, panel, as well as a book, because uh, of the particular uh, distorted histories that we have uh, grown up with in Pakistan and I guess uh, elsewhere in South Asia too. Uh, in particular, the event of 1971, uh, which is, uh, a, was it an India-Pakistan war or was it the liberation of Bangladesh or creation of a new nation state? So all these... Uh, uh, very uh, thorny questions are still uh, unresolved and, and uh, admired uh, by the, the nation state project that uh, all three countries in South Asia uphold very, clear, very closely and, and create and narrate and manufacture histories uh, from that point of view. So Anam's work is of vital importance because it brings in the people, the people who were at the center of 1971's uh, uh, conflict and uh, events, and uh, how some of the wounds uh, from that particular moment are still alive. And if we go back from uh, to 1947, uh, it, you know some of the, those. Uh, uh, wounds and uh, unresolved unre uh, issues are still haunting us even after 73 years. So, Anam, I'll come to you first and uh, ask you about your book and uh, what made you write it and how did you view this larger subject of people's history? It's a very ambitious undertaking. And uh, what was the real uh, sort of driver there in researching on this book? Thank you so much for that introduction, uh, Raza, and thank you to Ayla for organizing this fantastic panel. It's truly an honor to be sharing the virtual stage with all of you and to discuss my research and my work. Um, so this book was really kind of, it came out of my earlier research on partition on 1947. As I was conducting oral history interviews in India and Pakistan, I began to realize that at the state level, 1947 has a very different um, meaning in India versus Pakistan. It's institutionalized in a very different manner. In Pakistan, of course, 47 conjures up, you know, uh, memories of bloodshed, but also it is very much linked to a sense of triumph, a sense of tri uh, victory, a sense of nation making, the birth of Pakistan. And in India, it conjures up different images, different connotations. So as I, you know, started to realize that, okay, here's this one year one kind of event, um, you know, and it's looked at so differently. What about 71? Um, you know, uh, because I had kind of grown up in Pakistan registering it as a loss, uh, but largely to India. It was always kind of treated as this Indo-Pak war, the third Indo-Pak war was very kind of another bilateral conflict between these two um, hegemonic powers in South Asia. Um, and apart from that, I knew very little. So I started to think, okay, if 71 is, you know, I, I kind of, understand it, I register it in Pakistan as a loss, how is it viewed in Bangladesh? Even the terminology, of course, is so different. In Pakistan, commonly used terms are called of Dhaka or dismemberment of Pakistan. In Bangladesh, of course, it's called the War of Liberation. So I wanted to know more, but um, as I think all the panelists would know and many in the audience, our textbooks treat 71 in such a cursory fashion. Um, so 24 years of history of East and West Pakistan being one country and nine years of bloody war and bloodshed are wrapped up within a few paragraphs. And there's little uh, upset. 
Um, and where, you know, where we do make mention of it, it is always vis-a-vis -vis India, always, you know, vis-a-vis uh, -vis our relationship with the Eastern neighbor. And in that, what is silenced or what is never, you know, what I had at least not heard about growing up in Pakistan were stories of people and their experiences and how they endured the violence. There's so much silencing around that. So through this book, I wanted to look at 71 um, from both the state's perspective. So how is the same year kind of memorialized, remembered, and forgotten and silenced, you know, in unique ways in, in Pakistan and in Bangladesh and in India, because I really don't think that both 47 or 71 are just static events that we can move on from. They take on unique meanings and interpretations in the post 47 and 71 years. So what has that journey and process been like? So I visited a lot of museums and I looked at textbooks, but then I wanted to juxtapose this with people's history because I wanted to bring, bring forth those nuances, those varied experiences of 71, um, really for my own learning and unlearning um, and, you know, for trying to just essentially probe the silences and push um, beneath these, uh, these status narratives, um, you know, and, um, and really access um, other, other narratives of people who actually endured and lived through um, that year, who I, I worry that we're losing very quickly. Yes. Right. Thank you, uh, Anam. And uh, that brings me uh, you, you, some of the words that you chose, uh, in particular, silencing and learning and unlearning. I think that is a real challenge when it comes to uh, so much in uh, Pakistan, particularly what we imbibe from the textbooks. So on this uh, issue of silencing, I mean, I would like to go to Ali Usman Kasmi and ask him about uh, this particular aspect, because I think what the real strength of Anam's work is the fact that it challenges this culture, broad culture of silencing, of silence that we have nurtured. And uh, so much so that, you know, in our popular uh, narratives, in our poetry, in our, uh, 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 in our other works, 1971 is a completely or almost completely forgotten event. Even when it comes to popular, uh, you know, poetry, such as there's a very famous ghazal, wo hum safar tha, magar usse hum nawai na thi. Now, you know, I'm sure that uh, our viewers in South Asia are familiar because it's, uh, uh, this particular ghazal was appropriated by a, uh, uh, by a TV show, a TV play. And, uh, and, and uh, the young people who sing about it had no idea that it was actually composed for 1971's tragedy. They think it's about love, and which I, I suppose it is uh, in a very broad terms. But the reality is that it's a, the very uh, uh, act of composing the, uh, these verses has, uh, has, been, has been distorted and appropriated uh, by the corporate <laughs> neoliberal uh, you know, entertainment pr production. So Ali, um, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Raza, and thank you for having me as part of this panel. It's, it's, it's such an honor because it's such an important book by, by Anam. And I mean, I, I, when I read this book, I, I thought that this is, this is not a book, in my opinion, or at least in my reading, it's not a book about, about facts. It's not about like the factual details of what happened in 1971, as much as it's about how the memory of 1971 continues to, to shape who we are and through that memory, the selective memory of it, the, the selective remembrance of, of, uh, of that past, um, how we have uh, sort of uh, avoided confrontation with a very uncomfortable past of, of violence, of displacement. Um, and, uh, you know, so that's perhaps, you know, in, in my opinion, that's the, the most important aspect of, of this book and for which what Anam has done fantastically is to, to weave these stories together by by talking to you know a range of different people and bringing in a narrative which is um, sort of you know historical nonfiction and I think that the, the the choice of narrative itself the historical narrative itself is extremely important because the usual kind of formal academic style of writing is not able to incorporate the the sense of loss the sense of displacement which is the lived actual experience of of individuals of communities of millions of people who were affected because of uh, of this large scale violence and you know we are so very lucky to have uh, someone like urvashi batalia ji who i think uh, her work on 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 the partition of 1947 and the silencing of voices and the, you know uh, provides us with that kind of uh, of a prototype uh, for 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 this kind of historical narrative to be used 
while you know um while we can stick to uh you know a, a more um, in a way a kind of retelling of stories uh which can be dispassionate but at the same time trying to incorporate the sufferings of of the people now talking about uh, uh you know your comparison with uh, with 1947 with anam also pointed out and you like you said ke um ke ke partition literature jo hai for for instance uh, kitab mein bhi is baat ka zikr hai ke partition instance jo hai unhone asif farooq ki marhum ka hawala diya ke jitna 47 ki partition ke hawale se likha gaya hai utna 71 ke waqiat ke hawale se पाकिस्तान में नहीं लिखा गया या उर्दू या मुकामी जबानों में शायद नहीं लिखा गया मतलब यू हैव यू नो पीपल हैव परहैप्स हर्ड ऑफ फैज का यू नो की गजल बट नासिर काजमी की फॉर इंस्टेंस वो साहलों पे गाने वाले क्या हुए वो कश्तियां चलाने वाले क्या हुए और और फिक्शन लाइक रिटन बाय तारक महमूद बाय मसूद मुफ्ती बाय जीवन खान यू नो सो देयर इज लिटिल रिटन बट आई मीन देयर इज समथिंग व्हिच हैज बीन देयर unlike 1947 which um, you know has become kind of uh, a very recurrent theme in in literature not just in urdu but in punjabi as well in in sindhi as well but as anam anam pointed out 47 in pakistan at least is still about sacrifice it's about making a sacrifice to achieve something it's an achievement of uh, of statehood so in a way it's it's a celebration of uh, it's a celebration of 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 that uh, of that sacrifice whereas for 1971 71 has become kind of a of a metaphor for uh bengali betrayal predominantly you know you have uh, all these newspaper articles sh- tv talk shows where you know it's discussed now because of the tragedy which took place on uh, 16 december 2014 uh, the incident of aps now that has become um, you know uh, the, the the major event which took place on 16 december so the so the, the ceremonial kind of remembrance of east pakistan the loss of east pakistan has been replaced by a commemoration of the tragedy of army public school and the massacre that took place a um, few years ago but otherwise uh, the little that was being discussed i mean there was either a bengali betrayal or it was about the indian uh, interference or evil designs against pakistan or very little about the failures of pakistani federalism and how through a federal federal democratic structures we can avoid this kind of um, of um, you know a tragedy in, in future but it was never about our shared humanity it was never about what we did to our own countrymen uh, it was never about taking ownership of uh, of what we have done to 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 bengalis in um, in 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 1971 um and this is um, this is where i think the the importance it continues to be important it's not something which happened 50 years ago it continues to be repeated the the same kind of violence the same kind of rationale the same kind of logic for state formations for state making for justifying violence in fata in balochistan in interior sindh in in other parts of the country and there's the same kind of uh, of support the same kind of silence that you see in large parts of urban pakistan especially urban punjab it resonates i mean it reminds me again of the eerie silence which was there back in 1970 71 where major political parties major political leaders including zulfiqar ali bhutto were supportive of the military operation they celebrated the event of 25th march 1971 saying that pakistan god bless has been saved thanking uh, general yahya khan for what he had done so i think there is for pakistan Uh, a continued kind of uh, of a significance for the for the bangladeshis it is a, a very very important uh, the founding moment of 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 that country and uh, a celebration of the um you know of, of the freedom struggle of the liberation um and and perhaps it it matters for little if if if, if pakistanis uh, apologize to them for their atrocities but for pakistanis themselves they need to realize especially punjabis especially the punjabi establishment which was back then dominating which continues to dominate that by perpetuating this uh, logic for of, of violence it's kind of uh, you know it's cannibalizing their own identity their own language their own sense of being it's it, it keeps on dehumanizing them and it has uh, led to a situation where the state has become even more violent one could say you would hear this logic i mean the the, the bengali betrayal 
the traitor bengali has been replaced by you know uh, these pathans these baloch you know uh, words like that and uh, a justification for um, you know a uh, strict action against them in order to to achieve peace in the region to to carry out development in in these uh, provinces of pakistan and had it not been for people like manzoor pashtin or mohsin dawar or ali wazir or the pashtun tahfiz movement we would not have known the extent of violence which continues to take place i mean uh, we we might say that i mean uh, sorry that the, the panel has to be out in 71 but i cannot uh, avoid talking about the, the continuation of 1971 of the logic of 1971 in 2020 so which i think uh, needs to be pointed out so that people can understand this so people can know that you know you cannot uh, there is enough out there for you to realize what is happening in other parts of the country that this this violence is disastrous that this violence is causing displacement it's uh, it's inhuman and that you do not have any justification to say later on that we didn't know about it no it's out there it's right in front of your eyes and you're providing support for the the same kind of 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 logic which was used back in 1971 to uh, to to suppress voices uh in 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 dhaka in bangladesh in east pakistan and that there, there is a continuation which we happen which we see happening uh, even today so this suppression of that memory of what happened in 1971 is not without purpose it it serves a purpose uh and the purpose is to allow for the same kind of of logic to be employed even today with in fact even more brutality where we hear people are um, a former uh, army chief pervez musharraf saying that uh, that the, that that these people again these people won't even know what has hit them we now have the technology that where we can hit them and they won't even know what has happened to them and that these are people who are close to us so we could not manage east pakistan perhaps because it was too far away but you are right there in front of us so i think the uh the the amnesia is not without a purpose this silencing uh this erasure of memory is not without purpose so it's 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 extremely important to to highlight it and i think what anam has done brilliantly is to um you know to bring in the memories of of 47 of 71 of how it continues to haunt us whether we recognize it or not it is haunting us um and especially as as punjabis it it haunts us it haunts anam when she goes to bangladesh and when she has to to you cannot see those people in their eyes i mean you so i also had a similar experience when i visited dhaka a few years ago um yeah i mean i think i i'll just stop for for now and yeah <laughs> ali thank you so much and uh, for this impassioned uh, commentary on the book and as well as linking to the 90 uh, to uh, linking 1971 to a present moment and in so many ways as you said the erasure and suppression continues and continues to because as they say trauma never goes away i mean that's what most studies now show and so a, a, a collective trauma is also somewhere lingering and keeps on coming and popping its head back so i'll i'll move to uh, urvashi ji and uh, you know i wanted to uh, talk to you about uh, in particular the place of oral histories and the importance of oral histories and where they uh, and in particular in our subcontinental in a south asian uh, context why are they so important and in that sense how uh, is anam's book how would you locate anam's book in that particular uh, strain uh, thank you raza and uh, thanks to ilf you know the last time i spoke at the islamabad festival i was physically present there and got into a lot of trouble with uh, a lot of trolls in india who started saying oh these indian writers have gone off to so i'm sure i'll get into some trouble this time also uh, but uh, yeah anam uh, i want to thank you for uh, that wonderful book you know what i think about it because i have written about it uh, but in addition to um, what ali has said i think one of the really important things about that book is that it establishes how different the same history looks from different perspectives so the way the bangladeshi see it the way indian see it the way pakistani see that same moment in our collective history there are some completely different narratives there or different perceptions and somewhere they also coalesce and i think that's 
great. That's all right, because there shouldn't and there can't be one singular narrative of a history which is a shared history. Uh, Raza, you ask about um, oral narratives, oral histories, and I think uh, as Anam's book has shown and as work on partition uh, 47 has shown, and there's lots of work by different people, um, these stories, these histories are deeply important for us uh, in many ways. The first is because they keep alive the memory of a history that our states do their best to forget, to push under the carpet and to pretend that it will go away. Um, another is that for the people who lived through that history, being able to speak about it, being able to tell that story is both an acknowledgement and a form of closure in some ways for some people, not necessarily everyone. And for some, even a form of seeking justice. Because imagine that you have been at the receiving end of terrible violence, or your family has, or you've had a major loss, or there has been an abduction or a rape, and you're never able to speak about it again. So, uh, or there is no one to listen to you. So when someone actually uh, takes that empathetic step of asking for your story and listening to you, I think it means a lot to the people uh, who are speaking. And uh, the tragedy is that our states don't want to hear that because the listening to those stories and taking account of what they're saying will and can and does in so many instances teach us how to understand our pasts because our past so deeply influence our present. Ali has pointed to how 71 is evident and visible even today in 2020. 1947 still informs the ways in which we relate to each other. And you can see that here. I mean, we would not be able to meet physically um, easily because of the politics that are played out in our countries, which go back to those moments in our histories. So in a sense, the reason for not wanting to remember those histories on the part of the state is and to silence those histories is really because states want to impose their own singular narrative which is a narrative of nationhood and all of that. And they don't want any fault lines, cracks in it to become visible. And what Anam's book, I think, does uh, really well is it exposes both the fault lines and the longing on the part of people to actually be heard, to be taken account of. I mean, I had similar things in my own family where, you know, People were not able to talk about things because there was really no one to listen, no one to take account um, of that. And um, I think that um, in many ways, we uh, it's by listening to people's stories that we learn how history is lived out in daily life, how these large political discussion uh, decisions inform the, the small realities of our lives. And it is by listening to people also that we are able to explore the deeper silences, which say a traditional historical exploration can never lead us to. So the kind of things Ali was talking about now, the kind of things that Anam explores in her book, 19, uh, in 1971, for example, the mass rape of women, you will not find it in any major historical record, but you will find it in women's voices. Similarly, at partition, what happened with women, what happened with minorities, the ways in which people helped others. These are all stories that form part of the history and that help us to understand what happened so that we know what to avoid or how to avoid it in the future. And finally, I want to say that we talk about silence and these histories are silence. There is no doubt about that, but it's a very telling silence. In a sense, it's a silence under which there is a roar that is constantly there, that is just crying out to be heard. And the fact that young people today are exploring histories of 71 and partition is a really good sign that some attempts are being made to get under the skin of that silence and to hear the voices that actually live there waiting to be heard. So I'll Thank stop there. You. Thank you so much. That was really uh, a, a great, uh, you know, for, for my own learning as well. I think uh, the most important part of these oral histories, as you rightly say, are, are that not to 
to to have uh, a way not to repeat all all of what has happened and and perhaps that memory helps us so i'll go to nadim whom i uh, on second thoughts i should have gone to you first actually but uh, you know so as a fellow a writer and as uh, someone from bangladesh with roots there uh, what how did you read adam's book and and how do you think that the themes that she has picked in 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 the book uh, spoke to you <clears throat> thank you um great being here anam congratulations and it's really an honor to be on this panel so i m my first thoughts reading the book was why didn't this book exist 25 years ago 20 years ago when i was an undergraduate um because having grown up with 71 i mean it literally metaphorically in symbolically it's in my blood um this is what every bangladeshi at least in my generation it's the first story we hear even before we have our names um so i grew up listening to stories um day and night um and then i became so fascinated as a writer to explore this um my mind started to go around um you know why doesn't this exist on a world stage why aren't there bigger more um available materials about this uh so had i come across this book when i was a freshman or a sophomore at uh, at the university of illinois when i was seeking books and seeking uh, material um which led me to finding basically two books and at that time they were about as old as the war itself was um so there was no scholarship that i could find um that was accessible so as other um as as our other panelists have have pointed out um what anam's book does is it brings the stories of the people the the lived experiences many of whom are still alive including people in my family so it's when we talk politics when we talk geopolitics when we when we are constantly looking at it in in the context of political maneuvers and real politic um people's stories get lost and so we get mired in calling it in 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 giving the conflict name so uh, liberation war of bangladesh third indo-pak war uh civil war you know while we're while we're fighting over these terms the real stories that happened the real traumas that are still um unaddressed um that have been told to um you know get over it let's move beyond this let's let's have progress well we can't have progress unless we've spoken about what has happened in order for that progress to learn as usman pointed out in so we don't make those mistakes um and those same tactics don't come upon the people again which incidentally um also linking with usman's point um military tactics in bangladesh have not gone away um the bangladesh military uh, for example has turned on its own people the indigenous people of bangladesh um have basically been under military occupation um their lands have been taken away in the southern parts of the country and they're still uh, more or less living if not on the fringes rather beyond the fringes um so indigenous stories don't even exist uh, so anam's book um highlights the importance of the stories being brought forth that historians have not investigated historians are not investigating at this point and so as i read through um each of the each of the accounts um there are there are there are moments in there that i don't think unless someone actually sits down and looks a person in the in the eyes and asks them you know what happened at this and this point while the bigger war was happening elsewhere um and we learn that oh my gosh while we thought that there was a lag perhaps in the violence it was being carried out um it was still happening it was still happening in villages in in small towns um you know whether it was abductions or whether it was you know um uh, 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 uh kidnapping women um uh, you know or massacres in a large scale that we have we don't even know um for whatever reason which which brings me to the point of erasure and conveniently kind of 
uh, crafting a narrative that serves the current moment or serves a political end, which unfortunately has also happened in Bangladesh. For example, right now it's the Awami League in power. So the only narrative of 1971 that exists has to do with Sheikh Mujib and the contributions of, of, of the Awami League. So for example, um, anyone, uh, you know, on a, on a, on a national level, um, if they say that, oh, you know, Major Ziaur Rahman was the one that from Chittagong, from Kalurg Hut Station in Chittagong, um, actually uh, announced um, the Declaration of Independence um, in the name of Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, um, that becomes, you know, that people will, you know, there'll be hue and cry over that, um, at least from the part of the government, not the people, um, but, uh, and, and there's erasure. For example, uh, Ziaur Rahman's name um, is being uh, 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 erased, literally erased from history, from accounts, um, from the fact of existence. Why? Because of the Awami League BNP um, standoff. Um, I subscribe to neither. Um, you know, I, I am critical, uh, equally critical of both parties, um, equally um, try to keep my eyes on um, what one party would do when they're in power. And the same thing would happen um, if and when, and has happened, if and when BNP, the Bangladesh Nationalist Party, is in power. You know, Sheikh Mujib didn't happen. Oh, yes, he was he was someone, but we don't talk about him. We don't talk about the Awami League's contributions or, you know, the hundreds and thousands of people that were involved um, directly or indirectly or not at all, um, but had some kind of an affinity either way. So when 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 these sorts of roadblocks and erasures and uh, 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 narratives crafted to serve political purposes and also to silence, I'm glad we um, use that word to silence uh, uh, something a more a larger narrative. If if that keeps happening, you know, on the one hand, the importance of a book like Anam's will only be amplified, um, and on the other people will either um, keep forgetting generation after generation, uh, forgetting uh, because these have not been recorded. Um, history has not been allowed to be set down. It's been silenced. It's been um, uh, hampered. Um, and what we'll end up with two, three, four generations from now are, you know, it sanitized accounts, you know, that, that won't, that won't even fill up a hundred pages in a book. Um, so, all that said, I do I do also think that the fact that Anam's book um, is bringing together um, an international um, uh, dialogue about this is even more important because what has largely driven, at least in the mainstream, so to speak, what has largely driven and still drives conversations about 1971 are is the language that has been crafted by the West. And by the West, I mean the United States. Um, by the West, I mean the United Nations. Because to this day, um, you know, if we are parsing out what to call it and when to call it um, the Liberation War of Bangladesh or the Third Indo-Pak War, um, we didn't really decide those, um, and they're not they're not still decided un until and unless a panel like this, people like us, are part of this conversation. So I can sit here and say that yeah, it was it, it was the Liberation War of Bangladesh, and here are the complexities that are behind that. However, I don't, I don't not recognize the fact that, you know, for two weeks, this was a standoff between um, the forces of the, the military forces of, of Pakistan and India. But I, I, I'll also add that it was with the, uh, with, with the, with the, with the contribution, with the full on tactical contribution of the Mukti Bahini. Um, who were who were trained on the ground under General Osmani's command um, by um, uh, Indian forces, and it was the Joint Command, the Joint Operations Command, that finally, um, on December 16th, uh, dismantled the strongholds in Dhaka of of the Pakistan uh, of of the Pakistan Army. Uh, so, you know, for example, Tajuddin Ahmed, who was the um, who was who was the interim prime minister of what was in April founded as the Mujib Nagar government because Sheikh Mujib was imprisoned. Um, he was the one on the ground and he made a point of saying that 
uh, Niazi will not surrender to the Mukti Bahini. He he won't. Uh, uh, General Niazi was not going to sub, uh, to surrender to uh, the Mukti Bahini because he just wouldn't do it. His pride wouldn't allow him. But uh, Tajuddin Ahmed made it very clear that the surrender would happen to the Joint Forces Command, not to the Indian Army, and only to General Aurora. So these kinds of things um, we talk about because we are aware of it and. Um, again, coming back to a book like Anams, and, and I hope many more after this, um, these details have to be put into place so that when outside, um, outside uh, 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 accounts of this um, are kind of making it uh, binary or making it Indo-Pak war or, you know, putting it into um, even, even worse, putting it into a, let's say, Cold War context, uh, which it very much was, um, what we are talking about here gets lost. Um, these details become insignificant. And these, detail, these details include the people's stories. These details include all of these um, major characters who played a part that we don't talk about, that we don't hear about. Why? Because we get swept away in the politics and the big grand narrative and who gets to say which. Well, let all things be true at the same time as long as they're the truth instead of saying, oh, we can't say this because this is controversial. Oh, we can't say this because Awami League is in power. And if you do, somebody will knock on your door in the middle of the night and you know cause you trouble. And then when BNP comes to power, same thing will happen because you said, you know, Sheikh Mujib was, you, you know, gave his great speech of March 7, 1971, um, which was really the first time that he mentioned the name of Bangladesh. Um, so that's the importance of the book. That I And I think this book is just the beginning of many more that it's high time. And I think that whether our governments, whether whether um, the, the 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 nexus of power, whether they like it or not, this is going to happen. So, you know, they can they can try to erase, they can try to ban, they can try to silence. It's not going to be silenced because we don't live in a world like that anymore. Information is available, and young people whom I met and taught in uh, in Bangladesh when I lived there from 2017 to 2018, young people are hungry for this, and they will fight to know the truth they will fight to to set it down they will they will put themselves on the line to understand what they know and why they know it the way they know it and what they don't know and why <laughs> they don't know that so um you know that is really i think i believe needs to be the project whether we're writing it as history whether we, we are writing it um, in as, as fiction, which I have in my book in the time of the others. Um, so Anam's book just informs um, these conversations uh, um, in, in, in a rich way that we haven't had an opportunity yet. And I'm just excited to be part of it here. And I, and, and I just want to say that nothing, nothing ought to get in the way of us to continue doing this. Reza? Thank you uh, so much for the insights. And of course, I mean, as you, uh, you know, you mentioned erasure and all the the and status history. So I'll go back to Anam and be, 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 before that, I mean, you know, uh, picking up on what Ali uh, earlier said about the, the the Bengali betrayal. So you know, one of the more uh, more uh, intriguing uh, facets of 1971 is that the Biharis who were actually loyal, quote unquote to Pakistan and Pakistani state have been forlorn, right? And uh, so on my on my multiple uh, visits to Bangladesh and Dhaka, I had a chance to visit the Geneva camp and, uh, and other parts where uh, they still are, live as, uh, as different beings, you know, in terms of their citizenship. I believe there have been some, some court judgments now and some legal changes. Earlier, they were not even equal citizens of, mm -hmm. of Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Pakistan does not want to take them. Mm -hmm. Bangladesh didn't want to have them. And so, and Anam's book really uh, goes in, and, 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 you know, uh, focuses on this, uh, uh, again, forgotten, invisible uh, part, uh, part of 1971's uh, saga. I think Anam's connection is, uh, is uh, giving... Uh, uh, the internet connection is giving her some trouble. So I would uh, basically, before she joins us again, 
I let me uh, go to um, oh there she is Anam thank you so I was just talking about the your your mention of Biharis uh, and the other you know forgotten facets of 1971's history I mean troubled history so Anam I I quickly want to know uh, how how challenging your task was you know as a writer and as a it's not always easy to go to Bangladesh and. Uh, or for that matter, to India and collect these stories because you know you get all all sorts of reactions and and suspicion, you know, because the na nation states by definition are suspicious mm -hmm. of <laughs> of uh, people, right? So there there there's some element of security or, or national security being violated. So tell tell us about that, the process, and also the kind of reaction you got after the publication, because that's a story in itself. Thank you, Raza. Can you all hear me? I'm sorry, I'm having internet issues yeah. I'm all the days today, but those are the challenges of virtual life. Um, oh, we just lost Anam again, and uh, until she comes back, so Urvashi, I'll go. I'll go over to you and talk to you a little bit about, you know, as I mentioned earlier, how important it is for the nation states to write their you know, official histories, right? And place women and men and soldiers and, and the, uh, all categories in a particular box. And, and if you, uh, you know, move out of the, that box or, or upset the boundary, you either a traitor or a anti-national, you know, quote unquote. So, so tell us about this whole business of um, revisionism in across South Asia. I mean, of course, it's going on in all places, unfortunately. I mean, you know, uh, we've just talked about Pakistan at length and Nadeem alluded to uh, Bangladesh. Um, uh, oh, Anam is back, so I really don't know now. So please Anam, will you... Continue, please. Yeah. Let Anam yeah, respond yeah, yeah. because she's so, in danger so, of dropping yeah, off now that she's... Start. Okay, so um, thank you, Raza, for that question. There have been challenges on multiple fronts. I think firstly, just because of the sheer degree of violence this region has seen in South Asia, right? Sitting with those memories is always hard. And how do you do these interviews sensitively without triggering trauma? That's always something that's on my mind. It's it's, it's tricky uh, navigating, you know, listening, but then not pushing too hard. There are those kind of challenges. But then, as you said, doing research in this region, uh, it's particularly difficult because of visa issues. I mean, it took me, it was a whole process on its own, you know, getting to Bangladesh, uh, actually getting the visa. Um, I wasn't able to spend as much time as I would have liked to over there. I wasn't able to visit um, India because of how the relations have been between both countries since 2016. And then being a Pakistani in Bangladesh, um, that was difficult because there's such little people-to-people -people contact. Um, and for many Bangladeshis, I was the first Pakistani that they were ever meeting. And we were discussing 71. So the conversations were extremely charged. It was about a very sensitive topic. So how do you build trust and how, how can you be seen beyond a representative of the state? So those things are uh, always tricky terrains to navigate. But I think the greatest challenge, Raza, that I faced as a writer is how do you tell these stories um, without them being appropriated by nation states. So how do you tell and speak about people's pain without opening you know, the ground for people to come and usurp those stories and appropriate people's pain and weaponize people's pain, pain of a particular community, pitting it against another community uh, only to minimize their pain. So for instance, even in my work um, on Kashmir, how do you talk about aspirations or grievances on the Pakistani side of the line of control without that in any way drawing a moral equivalency or minimizing the grave human rights violations on the other side, the violence on the other side. How do you speak about Biharis? I, I, you know, I dropped off right there when you were talking about the camps. You know, how do you tell their stories, which have in many ways been weaponized by the Pakistani state to undermine the violence or to justify the violence against Bengalis or to justify the military action? How do you interview them? How do you record those stories? And how do you present them? without, again, you know, um, enabling an appropriation, enabling a weaponization, and enabling um, that pain to minimize other people's pain. Um, and it's tricky because once you put the work out there, it can always be selectively kind of remembered and selectively uh, censored. So those are, those are things that I still think about, I think. Um, and the ways, um, you know, the, the ways that I try to approach that is always looking across different 
lines from different communal lines, even if I was working on the Pakistani side, you know, speaking to the refugees that came in from across the LOC and their experiences too, and giving context. But, um, but once the work is out there, you know, it will be seen in a particular, through a particular lens and in, in a very divided region where we have these labels of, you know, um, Indian sponsored and Pakistani sponsored. And sometimes audiences um, and the states will, will continue to see you uh, through that a very limited myopic uh, prism and, and you have to just continue doing the work and um, because I think every time you receive that kind of response um, it, it shows you how important it is to to do this work because I really believe these stories can help us as Nadeem was saying earlier push beyond the binary understanding um, of these of these events of these years of this violence. Thank I you. A great, uh, thank God you stayed. <laughs> well, then the answer was great, but you know, of course, it's an act of bravery. I mean, that's just the fact of uh, uh, that you chose uh, the, these topics both in the 1971 book and the later Kashmir book. I mean, these are extremely difficult and uh, sen sensitive topics, as we call them. So I'll, I'll go back to Urvashi. I'll, I'll go back to that. Uh, you, you know the revisionism underway, and how I mean we have we have that challenge again once mm -hmm. in the region. Yeah, um, yeah, Rosa. I, you know, I think um, you mentioned you said it was an act of bravery that kind of book. I think it's also an act of empathy mm -hmm. because it is a shared history, and to stretch your hand across a border which mm -hmm. has become intractable because of the politics behind it. And to make the gesture that I want to listen to your story means that you also give legitimacy to that story. And I think that's a, a really important gesture. Uh, the last time I saw it made between Pakistanis and Bangladeshis was at a women's conference in Lahore many, many years ago when um, on the 30th anniversary um, of the 1971 uh, liberation war, Pakistani women dedicated the whole day to their Bangladeshi sisters and they uh, basically they apologized uh, an apology that states cannot make but people do or states do not make but people do and that was a very very moving thing so I, I see this book as following in that legacy. Um, the revisionism you know all our states in South Asia and of course elsewhere in the world are caught in the grip of very, very strong rightward swings. And the tragedy or the difficulty is that this is happening within a democratic framework. But uh, it also, to me, this kind of exploration of oral histories and of difficult histories that people are doing or citizens are doing, it's very important because it tries to disrupt the narrative of the state and it also, which is also what makes people who are doing it extremely vulnerable, but it also shows up the fragility or the shakiness of states that arrogate so much power to themselves, you know, who are so frightened of voices that can actually uh, take away from the narrative that they want to create and it's happening in all our countries. And with the history of, say, 1947, which I know much better than the history of 1971, um, the fact that there were no people, no good guys or bad guys, that there was no aggressor, and then um, it couldn't be divided into those binaries of aggressor and victim, um, makes it very difficult for our states to accept, because then it means accepting your own complicity and your own inability to understand your own people. So how do you deal with this? You turn them either into enemies, uh, which we see in the ways in which human rights defenders and all get picked up, or, or you turn them into people, into you infantilize them. And therefore you create a narrative that you feed to them and then you pull into the service of that narrative all the arms of the state. Uh, so that no other narrative is allowed in. And in that moment, people's voices become even more important and even more necessary. Thank you. Thank you. That's, uh, that's a great uh, cue to my next uh, question for Ali uh, Kasmi. And uh, Ali, is it possible uh, for us in, in the region to have a kind of a joint, jointly imagined or written <laughs> histories 
I mean, is is, there, is that is that even feasible? I mean, I know there has been some movement, and you were part of that uh, because uh, uh, taking the cue from European Union, where uh, where there are now attempts underway uh, to redress these particular uh, you know toxic uh, legacies. So, so tell us about that. Yeah, I think it's uh, the, the the project itself. Uh, it's uh, um, uh, it's it's very very feasible, but it's also it's all it always reminds me of uh, Ava Shahid Ali's uh, uh, lines about you know um, your history getting in yeah, yeah, yeah. my memories way or something like that. I don't remember the exact lines, yeah. but uh, but the problem is as Urvashi Batalia has said, as you also pointed out, that uh, history is central to the imagination of the entire state narrative, the imagination of nation itself. So each nation state in the region has institutionalized. That uh, that memory in a manner that feeds into a specific kind of uh, of uh, of an understanding of the past. So in in a way, um, you know. Uh, so, so what I'm trying to say is that history is uh, is become part of of the the, the status project of uh, of nation making of citizen making, and it has the 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 initiative then has to come as Rushi Ji was saying. The initiative then has to come from uh, from individuals, from citizens, from communities themselves, from scholars, from academics, uh, and the kind of work that uh, that Anam has done. And let me also point out that what Anam has done is it, it reminds me, you know, um, but Mantu I think wrote that uh, that none of the authors back in the 1947 uh, writing about the partition violence of 1947 were doing uh, a good job because they were all yeah. trying to to strike a balance. That for every uh, Hindu killed, uh, a Muslim had to be killed as well. For every Muslim woman picked up, a Hindu woman or Sikh woman had to be picked up as well. But Anam is not trying to to strike a balance. I mean, she she's trying to 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 narrate and to um, to to adopt a narrative style which can be retributive justice, which can be you know for to salvage some kind of our our own humanity, like I said. So, which is extremely. It's it's extremely delicate, you know, uh, to 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 be able to write this kind of uh, of a historical narrative is extremely challenging, and uh, and also lies lastly about your uh, question about uh, about shared history, would also you know uh, require a question about the the archive, like what kind of archive that we refer to. I mean, at the moment. As Anam was also pointing out, the one of the major limitations is that it's 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 divided histories and it's also divided along different borders. You cannot have access to to, to Indian archives, to Bangladeshi archives, and simultaneously for them to have access to to Pakistani archives. So, which also which which leaves the field open to to someone from um, from from the U.S. Or, or 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 Europe to come in and tell us our stories and tell us like uh, you know what happened, you know, and it it always it still is. Our stories are being taught, uh, talked about through through that lens. It's also it's it's uh, it's still being talked about uh, or looked at from uh, from Columbia, from Berkeley, from London, from Cambridge, right? So it's uh, so this, these divided histories is partially also because of divided archives, um, and we need access to to those archives. Yeah, and archives are also in safe custody of the nation state as a national security threat. I exactly know it's impossible to access them. And I've tried in, in all three countries, by the way. So anyway, I go to Nadim now. And uh, the, the, so just uh, if you want to respond to some of the comments, you know, about uh, what uh, Ali just said and uh, earlier Urvashi mentioned, you know, about appropriation and, and the process. I I 100% agree with Ali's point that we have to basically take back the stories that are ours and tell it the way we investigated thoroughly, um, objectively, and without um, taking sides and without it about being uh, political statements or stances or anything like that. And indeed, yes, um, I hope that we become the primary sources um that that are that 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 lead uh these dialogues and these conversations um that's one point the other thing i wanted to say is highlight the importance of 1947 to the emergence of bangladesh in 1971 um 1947 is the whole reason why it got started um i 
think we need to keep in mind that a majority of Bengalis, at least of a certain class um, and education and socioeconomic um, uh, 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 standing, uh, were in favor of, of uh, the creation of Pakistan and being part of the Muslim state, um, the independent Muslim state of Pakistan. Um, so that's one point. Um, the tides shifted in 1948 when um, uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah came to Dhaka and made his infamous declaration that, um, uh, that Urdu was going to be the state language of Pakistan, um, which fueled what eventually became uh, a few years later in 1952, the language movement um, and uh, during, during protests and de peaceful demonstrations in Dhaka, um, the police fired on, on the demonstrators and killed six young people. Um, and that was kind of a, a, a catalyst toward um, preserving uh, what was seen as being taken over by um, the state and by the imposition of one of the kind of the cornerstones of, of Bengali pride, which is language, Bangla language. Um, and so between 52 and 71, the, the, you know, the, the, the graph kind of went up and down um, until the, the, until the, the, the narrative started shifting toward autonomy. Autonomy became independence. So, that is a lot of history for me to condense into a few sentences. But my point is to keep in mind, I always keep on my radar that had 1947, 48, and 52, for example, not gone the way they had, then I wonder what would be happening in 1971. Because as I see it, it was first about Bengali identity, which then later became about Bangladeshi sovereignty. Um, which is which became the nation state project. So that's something that I think needs to be contextualized more often than not when when Bangladeshis, uh, Indians, um, Pakistani scholars, writers, historians, when we talk about it, is to always contextualize. Otherwise, you know, I, I believe we'll keep talking as 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 if or or rather, the conversation will keep happening as though these things happened in a vacuum. Um, you know, living here in the US, I'm constantly talking to people about, and to students about how much a sense of history is lacking. And because of that, the moments that this country faces now, you know, people, uh, issues are talked about out of context. Um, and once we link the history that has brought us to the moment, more things make sense. And that has happened in my education where I go, oh, 47 was just not about, you know, partition and about, uh, you know, uh, communal violence. And then there was India and then there was Pakistan. There was so much more. Um, there was so much more. And eventually, you know, it was kind of an education in and of itself for me to link that 71 eventually happened if I connect all the dots because of 1947. So that's important to keep in mind. Thank you. Thank you. We are almost out of time. And I, uh, you know, I must thank uh, the ILF and OUP for organizing this. Congrats again, Anam. And I just want to add a little point, I mean, because Nadine, you mentioned the US. So I mean, my own understanding and my own experience in the past few years has been that the Eurasia project is pretty, pretty well, uh, well organized and structured here too. I mean, it's it's so it's so well organized that you don't even see Native Americans on the streets, let alone read about them. Nothing. So it is because they have all been. Uh, you know, packed in, into re what they call reservations, mm -hmm. which are these little islands where you just go and live in, in these large ghettos, you know. So with that, I thank you all for joining uh, uh, me here. And uh, Anam, uh, I, we hope to read more books from you. And uh, good uh, bye. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Raja. Thank you all. Yeah.